Good morning, Europe. Welcome to the program. Our top stories for you this morning. Greece in mourning. A state of emergency and three days of mourning in Greece as at least 74 people are killed by the country's worst fire disaster in decades. The market does not exist anymore. As a settlement, it's, it's out of the map. It has been destroyed completely. It doesn't exist. Biblical disaster. The bodies of 26 people, many of them embracing, were found in the coastal village of Mati as the interior minister calls the fires a biblical disaster. Plus, our team in the Cube, our social media news desk, has been following this story as well. As families desperately appeal for information on their missing loved ones using social media, desperately trying to find out more. Breaking his silence, the French president says he and he alone is to blame as the scandal grows over his former bodyguard's assault on protesters. Trade tug of war, the EU's Jean-Claude Juncker is in Washington to talk business with Donald Trump to try to avert an all-out trade war. And ready for launch, the last four satellites of Europe's Galileo program are ready to blast off into space. We'll tell you why this matters to you and me. Thank you for starting your day with us. Our top story, Greece is coming to terms with the deaths of at least 74 people in the worst wildfires the country has experienced in over a decade. And there are fears that the number of dead could rise. Now, rescue and recovery efforts are ongoing this morning amid fears that parched as cropland could reignite in the hot, dry summer conditions. From Greece, Eamon Ogana sent this report. Once a picturesque Greek resort town, Mati today looks like a war zone. Ravaged by the worst wildfires in Greece in over a decade. At least 70 people have been killed, including families with young children, as rescuers search for the many more still missing. The inferno started here, 30 kilometers from Athens, late on Monday afternoon. The advancing flames spread quickly. Everything happened so fast. As far as I know, the one time they were trying to escape, the fire was uh, on the other side of the avenue, and within half an hour it was down here, next to the, next to the sea. Residents fled to take shelter in the sea, covered by water, their backs towards the flames. We stayed all of us together where we could put our feet on the ground, you know, so we'd be steady. Uh, we had turned anyone around so they wouldn't have the fire in their faces. Everyone was looking at the other way. And those who were in better condition were trying to take all the fire in their backs and everything. There was nothing else we could do. But luckily, everyone who was down here, uh, everyone came down. Here, we were very lucky. Not all were so lucky. Many in the area were unable to escape the spread of the blaze, even though they were just a few meters from the Aegean Sea. Emergency crews found the bodies of 26 victims, some of them children, lying close together near the top of a cliff. Some were holding each other in an embrace. This is the point where the 26 people went when the fire came from the mountain and they had nowhere else to go but to jump in the sea. But because the cliff was very, very abrupt there in this point, they could not do anything. So they just climbed, to the, went to the cliff down and they died from asphyxiation because they could not breathe. It was as, the conditions were tremendously, uh, tremendously bad, particularly from the respiratory system, you understand? This is where it happened. Wildfires are not uncommon in Greece, and a dry winter, hot summer, and strong winds helped create tinderbox conditions. The cause of the current blaze is not immediately clear, and authorities have ordered an investigation. For Greeks here, however, the damage has already been too much to bear. Well, Mati does not exist anymore. As a settlement, it's, it's out of the map, it has been destroyed completely. It doesn't exist. And it's true.
That was Eamon Ogana reporting, and he's joining me now from Mati in the Athens region. Uh, Eamon, you're there. You're in one of the worst hit areas. Can you, can you walk us through what you've seen so far? Sure. I've worked in many areas of conflict before, and yesterday walking around here in Mati really looked like a war zone. The streets were lined with scores of cars that were totally gutted out. The metal had been twisted and melted by the intensity of the heat. Uh, dead animals lined the streets. There were yellow body bags cordoned off by police. Um, residents wandered down the alleyways and streets here looking for their cars, their possessions, their homes, uh, missing neighbors and relatives. Uh, I saw one woman holding a piece of metal and I asked her what it was and it was her car. And it had been a new car. She only had about 4,000 kilometers on it. And it was the only piece of it she could still take uh, with her. And she'd lost her home and all her possessions in the fire. And for someone living in a country that's in economic crisis, this is a really hits her hard. Um, that woman, like many I spoke to, survived by taking shelter in the sea when the flames came and they came quickly. Lots of residents ran, abandoned their homes and cars and went into the sea covering themselves with water and facing their backs uh, towards the flames. They waited there for three hours before being rescued by the Coast Guard. Not everyone was so lucky. Emergency crews found a, a group of 26 people, including families and young children, who had been huddled together, some of them still embracing. Uh, they were trapped as they tried to find an escape route uh, between the fire and the sea. They were stuck on a cliff and they couldn't go anywhere. If they jumped, they would have died on the rocks. And if they stayed, they got asphyxiated and died, which is which is what they did. So pretty awful scenes here all around. Total carnage and devastation. It yeah. seems a little better today, but there's still airplanes and helicopters flying in the sky and rescue workers are still looking for missing people. All right. Thank you for that, Eamon. I mean, lots of heartbreaking images in your story there. Thank you for bringing us uh, the updates there. Eamon Ogana, they're reporting. Now, Greek uh, Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras said the disaster was, quote, an unspeakable tragedy. And here's what else he had to say. Today, Greece mourns. We declare a three-day national mourning period for those killed, but we should not let this mourning beat us. These hours are hours of fighting, of courage and solidarity. And one of the more harrowing stories to emerge from the disaster is that of the 26 people in Mati, as uh, Eamon had uh, mentioned, who died trying to escape the flames. Well, their bodies were discovered together, some of them hugging in one final embrace. And this woman, she narrowly escaped the same fate. When we realized there was no way out, we left our car in the middle of the road. I took my three-year-old child in my arms and started to run through a path towards the sea. We ended up on a path behind that house, went down to the beach and jumped into the sea. It was a matter of seconds to make it into the sea on time. I am sure that there were people behind me and I knew that they wouldn't make it. It was mathematically certain and they were indeed found. I don't know exactly how they got trapped in the field, probably before they got to the path. Only now do I realize that this is where the 26 people were found. Well, our journalist uh, Faye Dulkeri is on the ground in Mati and she's joining me now uh, live. Faye, can you just bring us up to date on uh, the latest on the search and rescue effort at the moment? Yes, of course, the search and rescue operation is still ongoing. I spoke to the fire department just a while ago and they told me that they still have to search around a thousand houses around the area. And now the big question is how many are the missing people? because the authorities are still not revealing, at least not yet, how many are the missing people. Policemen, firemen and members of Greek Red Cross teams are searching houses around the area. Behind me, you can see burnt houses that haven't been searched yet. Uh, Faye, what, so, about those, yeah, what about those people who um, have survived? Is there a plan in place for them? Where are they staying at the moment? Are there camps uh, being set up for them? Yes, there are specific uh, camps that they stay, uh, provided by the municipalities and the state. And I have to tell you that after the agony and the pain come the questions. How did this happen and how are we going to avoid this similar situation uh, in the future? People we spoke to yesterday told us that uh, during the fire there was no one there to tell them what to do. So, was there an evacuation plan? 
And if there was an evacuation plan of this area, why was it not executed? And who is responsible? And how, what do they have to do to avoid seeing their properties and their families and their friends burned in the future? Absolutely. A lot of people seeking answers. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Faye Dulkeri there in Amati. Thank you. And as you were mentioning, a lot of families asking questions, a lot of families also searching for still missing loved ones. And here, social media does play a role. Alex and the Cube team, they're following this side of the story. Alex. We have Tessa, and uh, it's fair to say it's a heartbreaking story. People desperately posting, asking for information on their loved ones. There's a website that people have been publicly adding details about their missing loved ones. They submit pictures and names and details of missing loved ones. Of course, while we cannot verify the status of these people, this is a public site where people send in asking for information. And you can already see dozens of people added to this list as of this morning. It is a deeply upsetting story as families desperately search for answers. We shared with you these photographs yesterday from the beach, an album of photographs as people try to flee the fire. Well, in the comments of these photos, people desperately saying, I think I recognize someone that I know in these pictures, and then asking for information about that person, appealing to find out. I think that's perhaps what's so difficult for many of those who have missing loved ones. It's wanting to know where they are and what their status is. At the moment, the information still uh, isn't clear. Appeals for information, like this one here from uh, a lady called Katerina. Uh, as of the time of this morning, this has been shared almost 50,000 times. She is desperately asking for information about her brother. Um, at this stage, it doesn't seem that that appeal has been successful in terms of getting her information, but people overwhelmingly have been posting their support for Katerina. As well, this lady here posting that both of her parents are missing, as well as her nieces and desperately asking as well for information on these people. So you can see people desperately reaching out, wanting some sense of uh, an answer from others on social media who might be able to give them uh, an indication of the status of their loved ones. But social media is also a place where those deeply moved by these people's stories are coming together to help. Greeks coming together on social media. Let's just bring you up this queue in Athens for a blood bank. People out of the door here, wanting to donate, the, to donate their blood to help those affected by uh, the crisis. There's also lists being published of doctors providing medical care, restaurants, hotels and other businesses opening their doors to help people affected by this. So while social media this morning is full of desperate appeals from desperate uh, families asking for information about their loved ones, it's also a place that Greeks are rallying together to show their support and to say we are here to help. We'll have the latest as this story develops on social. Indeed, That's it's good to see uh, humanity in the face of tragedy. Thank you for that, uh, Alex and the Cube team. And still to come for you on Good Morning Europe, we'll be talking to the Red Cross in Greece to find out what is being done to help the survivors of the deadly wildfire. And the uh, French president, he says he and he alone is to blame as a scandal grows over his former bodyguard's assault on protesters. We'll be back after a short break. Your top story in Good Morning Europe, a state of emergency and three days of mourning in Greece as at least 74 people are killed by the country's worst fire disaster in a decade. And now continuing with those deadly fires in Greece, scores of survivors have been left homeless. Now, homes have been destroyed in the normally picturesque seaside town of Mati. The Red Cross are coordinating the rescue efforts. And joining us now from the Red Cross in Greece is Georgia Trisimpioti. Thank you, uh, Georgia, for joining us uh, today in the program. Can you just uh, tell us what the latest uh, is uh, on the ground, the situation? Well... Uh, Hellenic Red Cross uh, volunteers uh, continue to provide uh, uh, first aid uh, and uh, rescue activities in Rafina and in Nea Magri, and we have been there from the very first hours of this devastating uh, wildfire. Right now, as your correspondent said, uh, the most burning issue is uh, the missing people. Uh, so we are very concerned uh, about missing people. Uh, people are already, uh, ex they have experienced uh, I mean, uh, terrible situations. They are in a state of uh, shock. And uh, uh, it's, they are suffering because they have lost contact with uh, their loved one. They don't know where they are, if they are safe. And we are trying with uh, specialized staff to uh, reestablish um, uh, family links. Uh, so this is one of our yeah, top the, 
for, for those people who are uh, un uh, understandably in shock, is there, what kind of support do they have uh, in dealing with this? First of all, we have uh, psychosocial support. Uh, we have already deployed in the area of uh, Rafina uh, a mobile clinic with specialists trying to help these people. Um, uh, because as you can understand, those families will need long-term support in order to recover from what they have been through. And uh, in fact, we're trying, we are working very closely with the authorities in order to ensure that uh, uh, people are getting the help they need. Indeed. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Georgia Cisimpioti from the Red Cross in Greece. Thank you. And of course, we will have more on this uh, harrowing story throughout the program. We will bring you all the latest. And now to France. The French President Emmanuel Macron, who has been at the center of a scandal involving his former security aide this week, says he alone is responsible. Well, the president was criticized for failing to respond sooner to allegations that his head of security, Alexandre Benalla, beat a male protester and dragged a woman away during the May Day celebrations. Well, he said this. Jamais, jamais, dans notre République, Never, never in our republic since a year ago has there been anyone protected or exempt from the rules or from the law of the republic, because that is what our fellow citizens expect from us. And if they're looking for the person in charge, tell them, tell them every day, he is standing before you. The only person responsible for this case is me and me alone. Well, here to give us all the latest is our correspondent, uh, Anne-Lise Borges. Anne-Lise, uh, this is being described as the, the, political, the biggest political crisis uh, of his time as president. Do you think that him speaking up right now has likely put an end to the scandal? That is a very good question, Tessa. It was a very interesting exercise there by Emmanuel Macron, a very interesting way of handling the situation. We had been uh, waiting to hear from the French president for days now. And uh, when the French president finally spoke, he didn't choose a public event, nor did he go on TV or even on social media. Instead, Emmanuel Macron chose a closed event for members of his own party, La République En Marche, to address the situation. And so he spoke among allies, and that's where he spoke about being the solely responsible for this situation. He said he was the one that trusted Alexandre Benalla and that that trusted had been betrayed. He said no heads would roll because of this incident to protect him. He would be the one taking full responsibility for this case. And uh, during that speech, Emmanuel Macron also felt compelled to address uh, several other issues, including rumors surrounding the nature of the relationship between the two men. Take a listen. Alexandre Benalla n'a jamais détenu le code du code. <laughs> Alexandre Benalla never held the nuclear code. Alexandre Benalla has never occupied a 300 meter squared residence at the Alma. Alexandre Benalla has never earned 10,000 euros, nor has Alexandre Benalla ever been my lover. Alexandre Benalla, although a porter for a day, never had these functions in the long term. So he has never been my lover. There were rumors of a possible romantic entanglement between the two men. Uh, Emmanuel Macron, even though on a light tone there, decided that he needed to address that as well. He spoke at length about that issue uh, last night, and he said, well, if they were looking for someone to blame, well, tell them to look no further. I am here. They can come and get me. Them, of course, being the opposition that had been ferocious up until now with regards to that incident. Yeah, and at least, I mean, he may have uh, joked a little bit there, but this really has been a major blow for his popularity, hasn't it? What, what has been the impact? This has certainly been uh, Emmanuel Macron's biggest crisis uh, so far. And uh, his popularity, his approval ratings had been in decline for a while now. They have now reached record lows. 60% of the French say they have an unfavorable opinion of Emmanuel Macron. He was hoping for a boost during the World Cup. That didn't help. And now as many as 80% of the French say that they are shocked with this incident, not so much uh, with the misconduct uh, by Alexandre Benalla, but also uh, with the structure that made that misconduct possible. 
All right, thank you for that. Uh, Anlise Borges uh, reporting there from Paris. Thanks. And still to come for you on the program, the EU's Jean-Claude Juncker is due to start business talks with Donald Trump in Washington to try to avert an all-out trade war. And over in the queue. The dam that was under construction has collapsed in Laos. We'll have the latest for you. That's after a short break. You're watching Good Morning Europe. Welcome back to the program. And thank you for joining us. European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker is meeting President Trump in Washington, D.C. today. It comes as the U.S. president offered aid to farmers who have been hit by retaliatory tariffs imposed on U.S. products by the European Union and China. Talks are expected to be fraught, with Juncker claiming President Trump referred to him as a, quote, brutal killer in their last meeting. Well, from the White House, NBC's chief White House correspondent Hallie Jackson has the latest. Good morning. Here at the White House, President Trump is firing a warning shot ahead of today's visit by European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker. Donald Trump tweeting, tariffs are the greatest, adding he may impose more unless a fair deal can be negotiated. Juncker is in town to talk trade with the president, hoping to head off more of a trade war between the U.S. and the European Union. President Trump has repeatedly complained about the EU now threatening a second round of tariffs, this time on imported vehicles. The White House has already announced some temporary relief for farmers hit hard by the tit-for-tat tariffs in place now. A $12 billion package intended to tide over Americans until better trade deals can be worked out. Donald Trump's top economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, was hoping Juncker would come to the table with a significant trade offer, but the commission has knocked that down. Instead, seeing this meeting as an opportunity to de-escalate the tension. The two leaders are set to meet later on this afternoon here at the White House. Hallie Jackson, NBC News for Euronews in Washington. Between the U.S. President and Jean-Claude Juncker, there are questions over whether the talks will bring any progress. With both sides uneager to budge, President Trump has declared trade tariffs as, quote, the greatest. Now, trade and economy expert David Hennig joins us live from London. David, I mean, these discussions is being billed as an effort to avert an all-out trade war. But if neither side is willing to budge, what can we expect out of it? I don't think we're expecting too much, I'm afraid. Um, we saw yesterday Trump tweeting tariffs are the greatest. Uh, the EU is going with a serious offer, but I find it hard to believe that the U.S. will accept that offer. Yeah, indeed. So what is at stake for the EU here? Juncker uh, wanting to talk to Donald Trump. What does he want out of it? For the, for the EU, clearly there are something like $42 billion uh, in car exports for the U.S. Each, each year. Not only that, there are um, EU producers in the U.S. and President Trump doesn't seem to be differentiating even between uh, cars produced in the EU and in the US. It's all, uh, it's all bad for him. There's car park trade as well. So there's a huge amount at stake. This is five times bigger than the, uh, than, than the steel uh, trade. So automotives is one of the world's largest traded uh, goods. Do you think, uh, David, that uh, this is an ace in, 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 in um, Jean-Claude Juncker's hand, the fact that Farmers are already getting hit in the United States. Do you think that he can use this, in fact, to argue that, wait, I think we should uh, calm down on, on the trade rhetoric? Yes, I mean, there is growing concern in the U.S. among farmers, among uh, members of Congress, senators. Um, that There is that clamor. I don't think it will work yet, but I think the EU will keep uh, pushing on that. I think we can use it. Um, so there is still some hope that somehow um, a, a way forward may be found. Uh, it might not be this time round, though. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, David Hennig, a trade and economy thank expert you. there talking to us from London. Thanks. We have a lot more for you on the program, uh, including more on that uh, national tragedy unfolding in Greece, where at least 74 people have been killed by wildfires and many families still searching for their missing loved ones. Plus, we will be in Pakistan to talk about what is at stake as millions of people head to the polls for general elections. And the EU is ready to launch the last four satellites of the Galileo program. What does that mean? We'll tell you what it means for us Earthlings. But first, we'll leave you with this no comment of the day from central Italy, where fields of poppies, daisies and cornflowers are drawing tourists from around the world.
top stories in Good Morning Europe, Greece in mourning. A state of emergency and three days of mourning in Greece as at least 74 people are killed by the country's worst fire disaster in a decade. Biblical disaster. The bodies of 26 people, many of them embracing, were found in the coastal village of Mati. As the interior minister calls the fires a biblical disaster. Breaking his silence, the French president says he and he alone is to blame as a scandal grows over his former bodyguard's assault on protesters. Trade tug of war. The EU's Jean-Claude Juncker is in Washington to talk business with Donald Trump to try to avert an all-out trade war. Greece is coming to terms with the deaths of at least 74 people in the worst wildfires the country has experienced in over a decade. Burnt out cars litter the streets as three days of national mourning begin. And with scores of people still missing, there are growing fears the number of dead could rise. As another day of rescue and recovery efforts gets underway, officials are keeping a close eye on the parched scrubland amid concerns that it could reignite in the hot, dry summer conditions. So what is being done to help Greece? Alistair Sanford joins me now in the studio to talk about this. Alistair, Greece, it's, it's a national tragedy, really. So what is the EU doing? to help out yes well this is uh, beyond Greece's capabilities uh, on its own to, to to deal with this and it did issue an urgent appeal on Monday night to other countries and to the EU for help uh, the response has been coordinated by the EU civil protection mechanism which is a voluntary scheme that was set up back in 2001 several countries uh, chipped in offering to help the EU Commission has singled out uh, three of them uh, which it says have offered concrete assistance, Cyprus, Spain and, and Bulgaria. Uh, Cyprus has sent some 60 firefighters and equipment yesterday. Uh, Spain's understood to be sending two Canada airplanes to drop water on the, on the affected areas. Uh, this, of course, is accompanied by the inevitable messages of solidarity. Uh, the Commission President, Jean-Claude Juncker, has spoken to the Greek President and the Prime Minister. The EU Commissioner for Humanitarian Aid went to Athens yesterday. Uh, he's um, going to coordinate the the EU's uh, assistance. Uh, this was the response of a spokesman uh, for the European Commission yesterday. During these difficult times, we stand side by side with the Greek people and the Greek authorities, and I commend the tireless and courageous efforts of the emergency responders. Everything possible will be done to support, to provide support today, tomorrow, and for as long as it takes. And of course, let's not forget that Greece is not the only country that is uh, suffering from wildfires. Even last week, Sweden had also asked for help. So countries were sending their help to Sweden. So is this testing actually the rescue mechanism of the EU, having several countries needing help stretching possibly resources? Yes, absolutely. The, the scale of this really is putting Europe, putting Europe's response to the test. And, and there are moves, there have been moves afoot to, to boost the EU's capability. Remember, we're here, we've got fires from the far north of Europe, there's a heat wave even in the Arctic Circle, from the far north right down to southeastern Europe. Sweden, as you mentioned, uh, has been having problems since last week with, with fires uh, all over the country. And Latvia too. The situation now is that several countries, at least nine countries, have offered help uh, to Sweden, some 300 firefighters with planes and helicopters as well. Uh, Latvia is getting help from the European satellite system Copernicus to help it locate wildfires in remote areas. Uh, but the problem with this is that it's all done voluntarily. This scheme dating back to 2001, coordinated then by Brussels. Since last year, the EU Commission has proposed its own disaster force uh, with its own resources. This, of course, remember, we had wildfires spreading across southern Europe from Portugal to Italy, uh, some 200 deaths last, year's, last year. Uh, and the e EU says, well, there's not just fires as well. We've also got uh, natural disasters like um, floods and, and storms, which are happening with more and more frequency. So Jean-Claude Juncker's proposal was for uh, what's called Resc EU, its own civil protection reserve. It wants Europe to offer, uh, the Commission wants Europe to offer more than just condolences and to scramble to, to respond to these sort of situations. Um, how would it work? Well, the EU would have its own reserve of its own assets, its own equipment, and also it would chip in with funding to help uh, national uh, resources. So it's not a scheme to replace uh, the national effort in this in these circumstances, but just to help member states deal with disasters. Uh, the EU, the European Parliament has passed the measure. Uh, the European Council of Ministers has also given its support. It's not got unanimous support, uh, but it does seem that a draft law is, is on its way.
seems a lot of uh, self-reflection and reassessment probably going to take place after this. Thank you for that, our correspondent, Alistair Sanford. Well, the fires in Greece taking place right now, this is not the only deadly and extreme weather uh, condition happening around the globe. In fact, Alex and the Cube team, they've been following, looking for more areas in the world where they're experiencing extreme weather. Yes, Tessa. So the fires on the ground, of course, we've been seeing these images from the ground in Greece, devastating fires. But zooming out, people are using satellite images to show that, in fact, these fires are so large near Athens, they can be seen from space. This uh, image here from uh, Pierre, who's uh, well known for using satellite images and making them user friendly, just to show the scale of this fire in Greece, the fact it can be seen from Spain. But let's zoom out from Greece to show you the European picture. As of this morning, this is the latest map generated by Copernicus, which uh, allows uh, you to monitor the fire risk. And right the way from the boot of Italy into the Arctic Circle, the risk of fire is high. In countries like Spain, the darker the colour, the, the greater the danger. In countries like Spain, there is an extreme danger, as well as other areas uh, around Italy, Tunisia. So this situation this morning is, uh, is ongoing. As of last night, this is the latest from Sweden. This showing you fires right the way through the country into the Arctic Circle that are either live right now or there is still work taking place to deal with the aftermath of the fires. So the situation there is still ongoing, although, of course, all eyes moving to Greece. Let's zoom out from Europe all together. Let's take you into uh, Laos, where uh, 100 millimetres of rain fell within three hours, swelling rivers and causing a dam to burst as well. Then in Japan, uh, we had, uh, they have had the, the highest temperature ever recorded in the country. 65 people have died, 22,000 people taken to hospital. And the, the country has described this as a natural disaster. Just check this out. These are the warnings that users are seeing when they go on the, um, on the transport system. Tips to avoid heat stroke. They include taking an umbrella with you wherever you go. Do not overexert yourself. Take enough breaks. When you feel unwell, don't hesitate to tell people. Now, people are linking these events, like uh, Eric here, who is a, uh, he's a meteorologist. He says here, from Japan to Greece to Laos, the world is hot, on fire, and flooding. He says it's climate change. It is worth saying, though, that debate is going on. But as a Telegraph report, even those in the Met Office are divided about the extent to which this is climate change, that you can directly attribute climate change to this extreme weather. But regardless of the debate, the reality is people around the world are having to deal with the real world effects of extreme weather. All right, thank you for that, uh, Alex and the CUBE team. Now, the uh, partner of Novichok victim, Don Sturgess, has uh, spoken for the first time since leaving hospital. Charlie Rowley was also hospitalized after giving Don the poison as a gift, believing it to be perfume. Well, Don uh, Sturgess died earlier this month after spraying Novichok on her wrists, which uh, Charlie Rowley said had a near immediate impact. Within 15 minutes, I believe Dawn said she felt that she had a headache. She asked me if I had any headache tablets. I went into the bathroom and and found her um, in the bath, fully clothed, led in the bath, um, in a very ill state. Now Ryanair have apologized to 2,500 customers who have seen their flights cancelled due to staff strikes. Cabin crew and ground staff in Italy, Spain and Belgium are on strike for 48 hours, demanding improvements in pay and safety conditions. Ryanair said that all passengers have been reaccommodated on alternative flights and they expect no further cancellations. The pop star Demi Lovato is recovering in hospital after a suspected overdose. The singer was rushed from home to Cedar Sinai Hospital in L.A. last night. Her spokesperson says she is awake and with her family. Lovato has been open about her battles with addiction and has struggled with substance abuse for many years. And still to come on the program, as Theresa May takes over Brexit negotiations, she faces charges of a coup against her Brexit secretary. And as millions head to the polls on election day in Pakistan, we'll bring the latest from Lahore. And that's after a short break. The top story on Good Morning Europe, a state of emergency and three days of mourning in Greece as at least 74 people are killed by the country's worst fire disaster in a decade. Now, hundreds of people are missing in Laos as a dam that was under construction collapsed. Let's go back to the cube uh, for this story. Alex. Tessa, the local government uh, in Laos in the region affected has released 
this video, which shows people wading through water. These people are uh, fleeing their villages after the uh, effects of uh, the dam. This dam collapsed. It was under construction and it flooded at least six villages. Here you can see people carrying young children, what's left of their belongings as they're being ushered away. Now this dam, this hydroelectric dam, was still under construction in Laos and it burst and at the moment hundreds are missing but the number of people killed is still unknown. Let's just show you the lengths people had to go to to escape the flood waters. Here you can see, if we can really push in on this, you can see people having to flee the water. The only safe place is on top of the roof of buildings, roofs of buildings. They were rescued from these roofs by boat. That is how extreme it was. So people obviously wondering how this dam came to collapse. Well, uh, CNN's uh, meteorologist Brandon Miller showing here a graph which perhaps, in his view anyway, shows the event that caused the dam to burst. And that is this six uh, meter rise in uh, the local Sukong River after 100 millimeters of rain fell on Sunday. He said that influx of water, that mass influx of water, swelled the river, pushed into the dam, causing the, uh, the dam, which was under construction, to burst. A lot of people from the international community now offering uh, their thoughts as another uh, seemingly extreme weather event is behind this tragedy. Um, from Singapore, messages of um, condolence, but also assistance. Uh, and also the South Korean uh, firm, which was involved in building the dam, also said they will be doing everything they can uh, to support uh, Laos as well. All right, thank you for that, uh, Alex uh, and the cute. Now, UK Prime Minister Theresa May is to take personal control of Brexit talks as a deadline for reaching a deal with the EU fast approaches. Well, she's been accused of sidelining the Brexit Secretary Dominic Raab, who is just two weeks into the job. Bryony Williams is joining us uh, now from London. Bryony, is it fair to say that Dominic Raab has been sidelined? I mean, what is the Prime Minister's motivation for this, do you think? Well, certainly a lot of MPs here do think he has been sidelined. Labour, the opposition party here, their Brexit minister, the shadow Brexit minister, Jenny Chapman, said he's been sidelined before he's even got a chance to put his feet under the table. Because as you said, he's only been in the job a few weeks. He took over from the former Brexit secretary, David Davis, because he walked away from the post because he didn't back Theresa May's Brexit plan. Now, when Dominic Raab took over, he says that the Theresa May did tell him that she was going to make this announcement. Dominic Raab was speaking in Parliament yesterday. He was being cross-examined by MPs over Brexit. And he said that there's a lot of moving of deck chairs in Whitehall at the moment. And this announcement from Theresa May just reaffirms that there's one team and one chain of command when it comes to Brexit negotiations. But of course, Theresa May backed the Remain campaign. So after yesterday's announcement, the financial markets here rose slightly because they believe with her at the helm there will be a softer Brexit come though at the end of those negotiations in October Tessa yeah Bryony uh, what about her taking the reins so how will this play uh, into the next phase which is a crucial phase of the negotiations Can you hear me, Bryony? Sorry, Tessa, could you, could you ask that again? I couldn't yeah, quite I just, hear you. Yeah, just very quickly. I just wanted to know that uh, Theresa May now taking control. Uh, how will this play into the next uh, phase, a crucial phase of negotiations? Well, as I said, she backed the Remain campaign. So really, this is her taking back control. She's had Boris Johnson, the Foreign Secretary, quit. She's had the former Brexit Secretary, David Davis, quit. So she's had to really reshuffle her cabinet when she hasn't really wanted to at this crucial phase. So this is her taking a stance because at the end of the day, this will be her legacy at the end of her term as Prime Minister, whether she gets this Brexit deal through or not for the UK people. All right, thank you for that. Bryony Williams, they're reporting in London. Thank you. And still to come on Good Morning Europe, countdown to launch as Europe is due to put four Galileo satellites to space later today. Do join us after the break. You're watching Good Morning Europe. Welcome back to the program. Now, a bomb has killed at least 25 people and wounded 40 in the Pakistani city of Quetta. The attack happened just after the polls opened for the country's parliamentary elections. Deadly violence, allegations of military influence and, quote, blatant manipulation have rocked the campaign. NBC producer Waj Khan is joining us now from Lahore. Waj, we're now seeing already election day violence and a lot of that even in the lead up. Can you tell us what the mood is like uh, today?
Clearly, there's two sorts of Pakistan which are voting in this election. Uh, the Pakistan closer to Afghanistan and Iran, the Western Badlands, uh, is uh, undergoing continuous violence. This attack uh, just this morning, which has killed uh, 25 now, was the second deadliest attack in this election campaign, uh, in this election process. The first one was a couple of weeks ago. That killed 166 people. That was the second deadliest bombing in Pakistan's violent history. But on the other side, in the mainland, closer to India, where I am in Lahore, uh, things are exciting. Uh, people are voting with their feet. Fashion houses, coffee shops are giving discounts to people who can show their ink uh, thumb imprint, which is a sign uh, of uh, casting the ballot. Uh, I just spoke to, uh, well, uh, the most ambitious man in the country, uh, Shabazz Sharif, who just took the reins uh, of power for his, the incumbent and the largest political party in the country, the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz. He's excited. He just cast his own ballot. That's him right there in the green shirt. Uh, he's excited uh, because he thinks that a high voter turnout will get him the sympathy vote, uh, which uh, he thinks he can catch that wave because of the conviction and the arrest of his brother, three-time Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. But the other most ambitious man in the country, cricketer turned playboy turned politician, Pakistan's rock star in chief, Imran Khan, uh, who has been campaigning relentlessly. He's 65, but he's campaigning like a 35-year-old at this point. 60 rallies in the last 20 days. I spoke to him earlier as well, and he's excited. But everybody seems to agree that voter turnout is essential. Khan is counting on the anti-incumbency vote. Sharif is counting on the sympathy vote. And the military, very importantly, is counting on the vote itself, the larger vote itself, so that allegations of rigging, which it has gotten of late, uh, are cancelled out. All right, thank you. For that, uh, NBC producer Waj Khan there giving us uh, a taste of what it's like on the ground in Pakistan as people go out to vote. Now, Europe's uh, homegrown civilian satellite navigation system, Galileo, will reach completion with the launch of four new satellites today. The blast-off will be at 25 past 1 CET when an Ariane 5 rocket carrying the satellites will depart from French Guiana. The new additions will bring the total number in orbit to 26, meaning that by the end of the year, the EU's version of GPS will be in full operation. Well, joining us uh, now is your new science correspondent, Jeremy Wilkes. Uh, Jeremy, it it's going to be fascinating for for uh, satellites into space. Uh, can you tell us what this means for people like you and me? Yeah, well, what it means, of course, we got a great launch, and Ariane 5 going to space is always nice to, to watch. But um, moving forward, basically, we have now in Europe our own civilian system for navigation. In fact, the, uh, the, the, the signal from Galileo is already coming down. So since 2016, it's been integrated. It's totally integrated with GPS and with GLONASS, the, the Russian version. And uh, moving forward, we're now going to have these 24, uh, well, 26 satellites up in space. The 24 is the magic number you need to be totally complete. It means that if you've got a modern phone, if you've got a modern car, um, they will be using their signals from Galileo. It gives you greater accuracy. That's the big thing that we will notice, uh, particularly if you're in a city. Uh, there are more satellites in the sky. Um, if you're in one of those kind of urban canyons, then you've got much better accuracy on where you are. So I guess without even knowing it, we're actually already using the system. Now, just briefly, yes. can you tell us how this would play into, you know, we've been covering weather today. How will this play into that? Well, of course, uh, emergency services, um, what's going on in Greece, the, the fires in Sweden, all of those are, require very good location accuracy. And the better it gets, the better they can do their job. Um, also, Galileo um, navigation is being used by the uh, Copernicus satellites, uh, which is the EU's project for Earth observation. So what they're looking at in terms of weather and climate on a day-to-day -day basis and in long-term trends also requires positioning and it requires timing. So all of that's getting better. It's all improved by this Galileo system. All right, very interesting. Thank you for that. Our science uh, correspondent and Jeremy Wilkes, thanks. And thank you for joining us on Good Morning Europe today. So stay with you with your news for all your stories. In the meantime, uh, no comment today is from Thailand. From my side, where 11 of the Thai boys and their coach have been ordained this morning as novice Buddhist monks.